Good morning. My brothers and I greet you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and truly, we have been blessed. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you, Marla. And thank you, Susan, for your music also as we prepared. This morning, the call to worship comes from a little book called The Doctrine and Covenants, the 61st, 61st section, verse 1a. Behold and hearken unto the voice of him who has all power, who is everlasting to everlasting, even Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Oh, Father in heaven, thank you for this glorious day that you have made, and we ask that you would be with your servant standing in your stead this hour, that he would bring those things that you would have him to share with us, and as we enter this season of thanksgiving, help us to remember always to give thanks to you from whom all blessings flow, in Jesus' name, amen. This is the portion of our service where we remember our covenant to bear one another's burdens. We give in this portion financially to the work, to God's work, to help those who are in need. And so I want to draw our attention to Mosiah, or Mosiah chapter 1, King Benjamin's speech. And the whole chapter, um, about half the chapter, deals with this very notion of giving to God and how God repays us. But in particular, from verse 88... Moreover, I would desire that you should consider on the blessed and happy state of those that keep the commandments of God. For behold, they are blessed in all things, both temporal and spiritual. And if they hold out the faith to the end, they are received into heaven, that thereby they may dwell with God in a state of never-ending happiness. And I want to testify to you that in my early 20s, shortly out of college, I felt impressed at one point to make a sacrificial offering, a giving to the Lord. And so I made preparation. I um, found a way to give this gift completely anonymously. It was my gift to God. And later on that week, I received in the mail, it was a, I think it was an insurance refund or an IRS uh, refund uh, a check that was greater by just a dollar or two than the amount I had just given. Now, I gave to God not expecting a return, but when that check came in, I was reminded of King Benjamin's speech. God reminded me that when I give, he blesses, both temporally and spiritually. Would you bow with me as we pray for this gift? Eternal Father in heaven, Lord, we are preparing to give to you. Lord, we give of our time and talents, but in this moment we are giving of some of the monies which you have given to us. And we give to you, Lord, asking that you would bless it and use it to care for those who are in need. We know that you care more deeply than us, but we have covenanted to be part of that. And so we ask for your blessing in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. For your consideration this morning, uh, 
Our first uh, scripture comes out of section 119, and this is one of the scriptures that uh, Aaron uh, put for reference for the monthly theme. And it starts uh, in verse 3. The elders and men of the church should be of cheerful heart and countenance among themselves and in their intercourse with their neighbors and men of the world, yet they must be without blame in word and deed. It is therefore not seemly that they indulge in loud and boisterous speech, or in the relating of coarse and vulgar stories, or those in which the names of their God and their Redeemer are blasphemed. Men of God who bear the vessels of the Lord, be ye clean in your bodies and in your clothing. Let your garments be of a sober character and free from excess of ornamentation. And avoid the use of, of tobacco and not be addicted to strong drink in any form, that your counsel to be temperate may be made effectual by your example. And then in section 85, verse 41. Art thou a brother or brethren? I salute you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in token or remembrance of the everlasting covenant, in which covenant I receive you to fellowship in a determination that is fixed, immovable, and unchangeable, to be your friend and brother through the grace of God, in the bonds of love, to walk in all the commandments of God blameless, in thanksgiving forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his record. I'm going to try to move this. It's good to be with you this morning. <clears throat> uh, thank everyone for the music. Uh, it's much appreciated. My brother-in-law and I, he's here, so hopefully he won't get too upset. Anytime either one of us has this responsibility, we uh, always tend to ask each other a question, and, and it's kind of a, a silly question, but um, one of us will say to the other, uh, are you ready to shell down the corn? And I don't even know what that really means. Uh, we, we, we've done it for so long now. It's, it's just something that we do every time. And um, today is not necessarily meant to be a shelling uh, to you, but more of a reminder uh, to each of us. <clears throat> and the main focus this morning that I want to convey to you is relationships. And I know that sounds kind of broad, but I want to talk about how we maintain those relationships that we already have established and how we strive to establish new and that we should be thankful for the opportunity to do both. Brother Stanley Johnson said, it is true that the Christ said his kingdom was not of this world, but he certainly intended it to be for this world and for the inhabitants therein. And that's what I want to talk about uh, this morning, uh, those inhabitants therein and the kingdom message to them, and the opportunity that we have to share it with them. Brother Oakman said, I have long been aware of the fact that this church will never accomplish its purpose until there are channels set up between heaven and earth in which men in heaven may come down and mingle with men on earth to instruct them, to counsel them, to give them aid and comfort in the work that we have to do here on earth. We're not called to build Zion, we're called to assist. The work of building the kingdom of Zion is God's work. And so, are you thankful for the opportunity to assist him in building his kingdom on earth? That's the question for the first question I'd pose to you. Brother Oakman goes on to say that we want God to be about our business, but we're not willing to be about his business. And how often is that statement true in your life? Uh, I ask myself the same question. But part of his business is the opportunity that we and his church have to share his love and his gospel to our fellow man. And this is part of the assistance that he needs from us. Are you thankful for the opportunity to assist him in sharing his kingdom message to others? Uh, This time of year is my favorite time of the year. Um, fall and, and harvest and the changing of the leaves and the cooler temperatures. 
Um, it doesn't bother me to have a Thanksgiving feast as well. Uh, the holiday times and uh, all those things that go along with this time of year. Um, and then it, also the reminders of the many blessings that we have. And the two questions that I've posed so far have included the word thankful. Um, this is not necessarily a Thanksgiving sermon, though. It's more a giving thanks sermon. So what are you thankful for? I know we all have a list, and I'm sure uh, that they are all different uh, if we were to compare them. Uh, my list may or may not include such things as RFD TV and the Western Channel, which are two of my favorite TV channels. But there should be some things on our list that would be in common with each other if we compared them, uh, such as our climately controlled shelter, uh, transportation, food, financial stability, and good health, all the basic physical blessings of this life. But what about these? Are these on our list? Our family, the gospel, the church, the priesthood, our heritage, the principle of Zion, scripture, and most importantly, God and Jesus. These are the things that our list should all have in common. So think about that as we go along, uh, what you're thankful for. Um, and and I, I'd like you to be as deep on that as you possibly can, not just, just the, the surface. But don't think about it so much that you don't listen to what else I have to say. Um, but I'm thankful for, in my own life, uh, for this gospel uh, that's shared to us through his church and his son. Thankful, of course, for my family, my wife, my daughters. I'm thankful for the heritage that I have in this church. The list goes on. I'm thankful for, the, for a free nation that we're afforded all the opportunities that we, we are. Thankful for, for those who defend and protect our freedoms. Thankful for the freedom to worship. I'm also thankful for the laws of the land that establish order and safety and health for us all. I'm thankful for my upbringing and my goodly parents. I'm thankful for each of you and for the relationships that we have. You know, I didn't come from a perfect household. My mom's here. She probably won't like to hear that. But it was a household uh, that was always striving towards doing the best that we could. And my parents taught us to never stop trying to fulfill our covenant with our Heavenly Father. They taught us to do what was right and just and how to treat others with respect and to interact in a positive and meaningful way. To lead by example and let our light shine through it. And I, know, I remember my dad was especially big on, on the uh, example. That was always a big deal. Uh, he wanted us to be a good example at school and, and to the other kids and, and everyone that we were around. And so as I was studying and preparing, uh, I was reminded of all the stories and testimonies that Dad used to tell when we were growing up about his grandfather and those experiences that he had in the missionary field um, while he was under general church appointment. My, my wife asked me if I had Kleenex, and I said, well, I have a handkerchief in my pocket, but we'll go with the Kleenex. <clears throat> Great-grandpa A.C. Martin was a 70 in the 1920s and 30s, and he traveled to the northwest U.S. and Canada mainly. Uh, he did some, some stints in Kansas also, and later he was a patriarch here in the center place. But I remember Dad telling about um, some of those stories that his grandpa shared with him, and, and there, there are some that are a little less serious than others. And I remember one in particular where he went to Kansas, and he was out in a farming community, uh, probably in the middle of nowhere. And in those days, of course, you know, uh, people were limited on, on the, the amenities that they had in life. And he started his series in, in a small church congregation, and, and at the end of that service, uh, a family came up to him, and mother and father, and, and said that they wanted him to go home with them and stay with him. And so he agreed, and he, he went home, he got with them and got to their house, and, and they had two beds in the house. And one bed, of course, was for mom and dad, 
the other bed was for all the children. And if I remember correctly, there were five, six kids, something like that. All very young, so, so small, uh, little kids. And that was the bed that he was offered. He, he got to sleep with the kids. And so he agreed, and uh, I'm sure it was an uncomfortable night's sleep. Um, I know what it's like to sleep with one of my kids, let alone a half a dozen. So the night went on, and uh, he woke up in the morning, and uh, much to his dismay, I'm sure, every one of those kids had wet the bed. But the good news is, great-grandpa didn't let that dampen his spirit. So, <clears throat> but, but that's just a, a, an example of a lighthearted story from our heritage. Uh, I'm thankful to know uh, of it, but there's a much more serious side to our heritage uh, that I'm even more thankful for. <clears throat> and most of us will, will know this story, but in the late 1830s, there was a group of people that were peaceful and industrious, thrifty and neighborly, wanting only to worship their God and share the message of Jesus Christ to their fellow man. They also wanted to build a city called Zion, which would have been right here in Independence. But they made one mistake. They thought the people that already lived here would accept the idea since it was God's plan. And the people of Jackson County in this area, uh, they were not accepting of the idea. And this group of people known as the Latter-day Saints were violently driven out of Jackson County. And they fled across the Missouri River to Clay County, and they enjoyed some short-lived peaceful times there. Eventually, the persecution and violence found them again. And they were given their own county eventually, uh, only to have it taken away by mobs and violence. And lives were lost and property taken, and the governor of the state even issued an order to rid the state of all Latter-day Saints. And the saints were driven uh, from Missouri into Iowa and Illinois and places round about where they found refuge for a time. And during this time of persecution here in Missouri, the leaders of the church were wrongfully jailed and mistreated. But God prepared the way and they were able to escape and rejoin the saints outside Missouri. And to, to us, what the saints endured is unimaginable, uh, I would say. Um, and I, I doubt that any of us have ever gone through what the early saints went through. And they went through that nearly everywhere that they went. But I'm thankful for that. Um, I'm thankful that we have those accounts uh, that show us their valiant testimony of this church that we're associated with. And it shows us that God is in it because he never left them. And eventually they received a, a period of Zionic quality in their lives uh, in Nauvoo. But I'm not here to give you a church history lesson this morning. Uh, it, it is my, my personal favorite topic, but I want to illustrate the point to you that these early saints should be an example to us. They were clo close with each other and had a bond through their relationship with their Lord and each other. Are you thankful for these forerunners that have gone before us? And I remember when I was young, um, not that I'm old if you compare me to Earl or someone like that, but I remember when I was young, and, and these stories would come alive to me uh, as I heard them uh, shared and, and as we read about them in church history and, and had our, our classes and so forth, um, and as we would visit the, the uh, historic sites where the events took place. My point to you is, that that's one of the things that we should not forget. And now, as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story is this. The story of the early saints is not just about the persecution. There's more to it. There's a positive side to it. And that is all of the relationships that were made in and out of the church. The saints had a positive impact on many who never even joined the church but were their friends and stood by them, even in their persecution, some being persecuted themselves for defending the saints. And throughout life, we establish many relationships with our fellow man. Some are easy and lasting. Some are harder and take more work. What's important is cultivating these relationships and growing them to be healthy and bear good fruit. 
Each one in the relationship needs the other. The seed must be planted, like the mustard seed. It may start out very small, but with the proper care, it will grow roots and become strong. And so it goes with our relationships. Our fellow man deserves and needs us to invest this in him. Are we worthy of him? Will we be willing to invest our time, energy, our resources, and share our testimony with him? If we, if we do this and do it right, it will be one of the things in life we should be most thankful for. To be effective, we need social interaction. And to establish, establish relationships and friendships, we will not become all we are, capable of becoming without the support of our brothers and sisters. And we know that this gospel is about saving souls. And we can't assist the Lord in that by sitting on our hands and waiting for someone else to make the first move. We must be engaged to make that difference that is required. I'm thankful for this principle because it holds me accountable to my fellow man and to each of you. If I am concerned about my brother or sister's well-being, then I should be engaged in their life. They need to know that I care for them and love them. And we know this is easier with the the lovable uh, more than it is with the unlovable. But Christ set the example to love all, even those that no one else would love or show kindness to. He wants all to receive the salvation and life everlasting that he has taught us about. At work, uh, we often refer to relationships kind of in a superficial way, I think, by calling, calling it networking. And I don't really care for this term. Uh, I prefer to just call it like it is or maybe like it should be, in my opinion, relationship building. I think that's pretty uh, simple and straightforward. But I, I like to call it that because it means more to me than just uh, one of the you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, or what can I get out of you or out of, out of our deal. But I, I want to know these people and be their friend. I want to build a good relationship that's mutually beneficial. And it can sometimes be a challenge with different personalities, especially in the construction business. I remember a concrete subcontractor we use um, would almost never answer his, his phone or return calls uh, to one of the other superintendents that, we, uh, that I worked with. Uh, because that superintendent was always pestering and bothering this guy to the point that the man was always frustrated and even angry. <clears throat> but I figured out what this guy needed was a friend and someone that was sincerely interested in his problems and struggles. And this man could be pretty hard and, and cranky at times, so it wasn't always easy. But now at this point, we've been friends for many years. And he's the kind that will do anything for you. And he almost always answers my calls. He's a good guy that needed someone to invest a little into him. And the other superintendent was never interested in anything more than what he could get out of the concrete sub. Sometimes all it takes is a friendly countenance to crack the shell and plant the seed of kindness. I'm thankful for the opportunity to develop new friendships and relationships but I'm just as thankful for the existing relationships and friendships that I can nurture along in my life. A question for you, are you trying to establish and nurture relationships in your own neighborhood and community? For me, or for our family um, in our neighborhood, we know of several of the neighbors on our street, but we don't know them. To me, there's a difference to be known of and to be known. We're known by Christ, and he wants us to know him, just as we are called to know our neighbor and fellow man. We all need to be known in some way. I don't want my nephew to get excited about this, this, these next words. Ethan's uh, involved in uh, film in school and... and, uh, So don't misunderstand the words that I'm about to use. Here's the question. Are you a reactor or an interactor? It has nothing to do with Hollywood. A reactor is someone who only speaks when spoken to, only waves when waved to, only cares when they need cared for. An interactor 
is someone who makes the first move, someone who steps out to be the first to speak, to wave, to care without being cared for. Do you react to your neighbors or do you interact with them? Do you strike up a conversation and take the time to get to know what's important to them? Or do you simply say hi and leave it at that? And there's nothing wrong with saying hi, but is that the best that you can do? And this thought doesn't just apply to those who are friendly or cordial to you. It applies to those who, who the scriptures refer to as your enemies. In Matthew 5, 45 through 50, we find this. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. And Jesus says, But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father who is in heaven, for he maketh the Son, his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love only them which love you, what reward have you? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Ye are therefore commanded to be perfect, even as your Father, who is in heaven, is perfect. <clears throat> so we should take no thought to whether or not it's someone that likes us, or someone that we like, or if it's someone who persecutes us like the saints of old. Each is worthy of our attention. And we are commanded to love our brother. And First John 3 speaks of this and tells us that we should love one another. Are we sharing the light of Christ and being the example we're called to be? Again, in Matthew 5, which is a familiar scripture uh, to us, I'm sure we could probably all quote it. Uh, start in verse 15. Verily, verily, I say unto you, I give unto you to be the salt of the earth. But if the salt shall lose its savor, wherewith shall the earth be salted? The salt shall thenceforth be good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Verily, verily, I say unto you, I give unto you to be the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Behold, do men light a candle and put it under a bushel? Nay, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light to all, there, to all that are in the house. Therefore, let your light so shine before this world, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. The persecutors of the early church had no love for the strangers who had come into their midst to build a city with a strange name that they had never heard of. Are we like the saints of old, or are we like the persecutors? Do we act in love toward our brother, or do we become angered when we don't see eye to eye with each other? And this can happen inside uh, the church as easily as it can happen outside the church. If we are not found preferring our brother, we should always have their best interest at heart. Think about what that means to you and answer it honestly. Are you found doing that, or are you seen as someone who thinks their position is right no matter what, and that you're not going to budge. I know I can be that way. And I'm not suggesting that we waver or compromise on the things that are of eternal value or consequence, so don't misunderstand. But what I am saying is always try to look at a situation through the other person's eyes and through their point of view. Put yourself in their shoes and try to walk a mile or two. And if you act in love with sincerity for the other person's best, best interest, understanding and compassion will come into your life. Striving to reach this understanding uh, and charity towards your brother because you want to be better can become a blessing that you can be thankful for. Remember, it's not where we are right now that's important, but where we are going and what we can become. <clears throat> in his book, Fundamentals, uh, F. Henry Edwards says this. I know this is one of Dave Keller's favorite books, and it's one of mine as well. <clears throat> he says, A good man is not one who never has a doubt, but one who determines to act in spite of all difficulties. 
who acts in the light of his best understanding, who corrects his way of life as his understanding matures, and who has sufficient confidence in God to believe that objections will disappear as he persists in the way of truth. Such a man knows that he is safe in doing the best he can do as a prelude to doing better than he yet knows. <clears throat> While Jesus was here, he fully understood the purpose of God and lived a life of sinless devotion so that he became at once the teacher and the example of all who were truly seeking light. But in spite of his splendid instruction and example, the early disciples fell far short of the pattern set for them. And it was only by uniting them in the body of Christ, to which every member could contribute his part, that there was any hope of carrying forward his message and his example to the people of that age and, and of succeeding ages. The experience which men gain as members of a well-integrated body is much more than the total of their individual experiences. The sweetness of fellowship and communion with each other and with God is beyond the reach of any number of individuals as individuals. It cannot be appreciated from observation, but must be shared by those who are bound together by their joint devotion to the divine purpose, and who thus become one in spite of their many other differences. It was because of this that the hours which Jesus gave to the instruction of the twelve were not spent with twelve individuals, but with a single group in which each man lost something of himself in becoming part of the whole. The church was built then not merely because of the human tendency for persons with common interests to get together, but for this reason, plus some specific and urgent necessities. The necessity for the disciples to share their expanding experience of what it means to be a Christian. The necessity for demonstrating the power of Christianity to unbelievers and the necessity for providing continuity between the religious life of one generation and that of the next. We do not grow best by ourselves, but in the process of rubbing shoulders with humanity, and the highest type of, type of personality is achieved in association with good people in challenging and worthy causes. So we come back once again to the words and example of Jesus. He is the way. His life embodies the greatest truth. Here is the, is the supreme intelligence that we, shall, that we shall answer the end of our creation. Head, heart, and mind must each acquire their utmost skill. But life consists of more than these. It must be centered in the eternities. The wise man will demonstrate his wisdom by making every act count toward enrichment of his entire personality, both for the present and the future. His life will be properly adjusted to that of his fellows, he will see the menace to his own well-being, which lives in his brother's lack. And he will testify his, his brother's need for both for his own sake and because life and inspiration have conspired to teach him the higher wisdom of brotherhood. <clears throat> and like the early saints, there may be times in our lives when we are persecuted and challenged Maybe not to that extreme, but maybe we will be. But what matters is how we interact with it. Will it break us or strengthen our resolve as a people? And we know that uh, now in the church, uh, we've seen our numbers decline, but we must find ways to build up and not tear down. We must have interaction with our God and each other and mankind in a real and positive way. We must hold fast to the rod of iron that we are not lost along the way. This is an opportunity. Are you thankful for it? Brother Oakman said, Jesus sowed the testimony of God into the hearts of men, and so it's our responsibility to share that which has been planted in our hearts with all who will hear that they may benefit from it. <clears throat> uh, my brother-in-law, Craig, preached uh, last Sunday at Oak Grove, and uh, he shared about an article that Evan Fry wrote in the Herald in 1931. And uh, the date, even though it's a long time ago, that shouldn't much matter to us. Uh, it, is, it is still applicable today, and I think you'll see that. But the article talks about righteousness, and I want to apply it to relationships specifically today. 
Brother Fry says that draw a level line on the largest piece of paper which you can imagine, and carrying that line off the paper, clear into space to infinity. Then at the beginning of the line, draw another line, but don't draw it parallel to the first line, but draw it with the sharpest angle possible. So they start out very close to each other, almost parallel, but as they extend, they become farther and farther apart, so that eventually, the space between them is as vast as the space that separates heaven from hell. So now let's apply that to our relationships with others and think about how much work it can take to keep our interaction with others uh, on the level. Sometimes it doesn't take much deviation in our relationship to begin to grow apart. It takes that constant awareness and adjustment to remain close. Sometimes the lines of separation may look like a mountain range reflected in the water, where each one's line is up and down, back and forth, close and far apart. But the challenge is keeping the line straight and close. And this is why Christ needs to be our level line. He needs to be in the middle. He needs to be in our relationships to include him because he is truth. He wants us to need each other and to be together as his children, which provides strength to us. He is our common bond and will work in us to keep our path straight, whether it's our relationship with him or each other or both. He is the way. His line is always level and straight. The best way to keep a relationship true is when Jesus is in the middle and we aim to keep our lives true to him. When something is level or plumb, uh, a carpenter calls it true. And we, we know that Jesus was a carpenter and so for me that's a good way um, to remember to keep him as our gauge of truth. And that's something that we should give thanks for every day. So I'll ask you one last time, what do you have to be thankful for? There's many things that we can be thankful for and many things that I haven't even mentioned today. But think about those things. I know I'm thankful for the opportunity to be part of this work. I'm thankful for those who have gone before us for those who are here now, and for those who are yet to be here with us. And so in closing, I'd like to read to you a promise out of Genesis 9, uh, 21 through 23. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant, which I made unto thy father Enoch, that when men should keep all my commandments, Zion should again come on the earth. The city of Enoch, which I have caught up unto myself. And this is mine everlasting covenant, that when thy posterity <clears throat> shall embrace the truth and look upward, then shall Zion look downward, and all the heavens shall shake with gladness, and the earth shall tremble with joy. And the general assembly of the church of the firstborn shall come down out of heaven, and possess the earth, and shall have place until the end come. And this is mine everlasting covenant, which I made with thy father Enoch. And then section 61, 6. And now verily I say unto you, and what I say unto one, I say unto all, be of good cheer, little children, for I am in your midst, and I have not forsaken you. And inasmuch as you have humbled yourselves before me, the blessings of the kingdom are yours. Gird up your loins and be watchful and be sober, looking forth for the coming of the Son of Man. For he cometh in an hour you think not. Pray always that you enter in, in, not into temptation, that you may abide the day of his coming. <clears throat> And lastly, um, I'd like to read a prayer. Uh, this prayer is not from uh, a minister or a uh, pastor or uh, anything like that. This prayer is quoted from President Harry S. Truman. And it's a prayer that he uh, uttered every day for many, many years. And I want you to pay particular attention to each word that he says. O oh, almighty and everlasting God, creator of heaven, earth, and the universe, help me to be 
to think, to act what is right, because it is right. Make me truthful, honest, and honorable in all things. Make me intellectually honest for the sake of right and honor, and without thought of reward to me. Give me the ability to be charitable, forgiving, and patient with my fellow men. Help me to understand their motives and their shortcomings, even as thou understands mine. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Sean. We will sing the amen on the closing hymn. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this chance we've had to come to your house and to worship together and for the words that you have brought to us through your servant. Father, we thank you for all of your creation and especially the precious gift of those many souls that you have created and placed in this earth and for those gathered here that we have opportunity to worship together with and for those that you have created that we may have opportunity to share with in greater ways in the future. Father, I pray that you would pour out your blessing upon us that we might know how to be good friends even as your son was, that we might know how to better love one another with that same love that you have showed to us. Father, we pray that your kingdom might come soon on this earth and that you would open our eyes, that we would see those opportunities to share together and to help one another along the path, that we might rejoice together in the end. Father, we love you and we ask thy blessing and pray this in Jesus' name.